بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدرى كما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله Respected brothers and sisters It's a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we've reached these Mubarak last 10 nights of this glorious month and the scholars mention that the spiritual blessings of the entire year is concentrated in the month of Ramadan. All of the spiritual blessings and all of the bounties and ajr and virtues of the entire year are situated and concentrated in the month of Ramadan. And all of the blessings and virtues of the month of Ramadan are concentrated in the last 10 nights and days. And all of the spiritual blessings of the last 10 nights and days is situated and concentrated in Laylatul Qadr. So these days and nights is the cream of the cream of the cream, the virtue of the most virtuous of the virtuous of all nights and days. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with that blessing. So it's a, a beautiful thing that has been mentioned is what is the reality of Laylatul Qadr and the surah an entire surah was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding this that inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr verily we have revealed this Quran on Laylatul Qadr so with this being said we have to understand that there is a historical Laylatul Qadr this is what this ayah is talking about also what the Qur'an they read tonight that inna anzalnahu fi laylatin mubarakatin inna kunna munzirin fiha yufraqu kullu amrin hakim that verily we have revealed this Quran on a very blessed night so that in particular is called the historical laylatul qadr the night on which the Quran was revealed you can say upon the heart of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those first five verses of Iqra Bismi Rabbika alladhi khalaq khalaq al-insana min alaq Iqra wa Rabbuka al-akram alladhi allama bil qalam allama al-insana ma alam ya'alam these special first five verses of the Quran when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in Ghari Hira and he was in a state of fasting and he was in the Atikaf secluded from all of humanity there, Sayyidina Jibreel, in that Mubarak place, in that Mubarak hour, in that Mubarak night, on the Mubarak heart of the Prophet ﷺ, this Qur'an was revealed. That night is considered the night of great esteem, the night of great power, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. Wa ma adraka ma laylatul qadr. What can make you come to know the reality of this laylatul qadr? How Allah is saying, what can make you come to know? How can you come to really know the reality of this night? Laylatul Qadri Khairun min Alfi Shahar. Let me tell you, Laylatul Qadr is better than a thousand months. Laylatul Qadr, the value of that one night in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal, the value of worship on that night, the value of ibadah on that night, the value of standing on that night, and the value of its its, its magnitude is better than a thousand months in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرٍ If that was still not enough, that that one night is equal to a thousand, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ The angels and especially Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam descend on that night. Can you imagine? What do they do? مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرٍ They're saying Ameen to the du'as of those who are making du'a. They are sending salutations upon those who are praying and doing anything. The angels are descending and the angels are doing what? They are saying Ameen to those who make du'a. They are joining those who are in dhikr. They are praying 
for those and sending salutations upon those who are in any act of worship on this night. Right? Salamun hiya hatta matla'il fajr that peace and blessings of Allah descend hatta matla'il fajr till the rising of dawn. So brothers and sisters, this is such a blessed moment and such a blessed hour. But one aspect that I wanted to touch upon is what is this night really? What is this virtue of Laylatul Qadr really? And I want us to look at it from this perspective that this night is actually a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is one aspect we have to understand. That to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this night as a gift to the ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and it is a gift that was not given to any other ummah before. And it was not given to any other prophet before. This is a speciality and a special virtue by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has elevated Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu over all of creation, over all of the prophets. And the story behind this is mentioned. Imam Malik rahimahullah narrates. He says, Balaghani anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uriya a'amarun nasi qablahu. Sayyidina Imam Malik rahimahullah says that it has reached me. That Sayyidina Rasulullah was shown the lives of his ummah. He was shown the lifespan of his ummah. So when he looked at it, that, oh, my ummah, they're going to be living from years 60 to 70 years. This is average. 60 to 70 years is average life of life expectancy of general people of the ummah of the Prophet. So he was shown this. Oh, masha'allahu min dhalik. Or something similar to this. Yani he was shown the lifespan of his ummas. فَكَأَنَّهُ تَقَاصَرَ أَعْمَارَ أُمَّتِهِ He saw that the lifespan and the, you know, the, the, the duration of the lives of his, of his ummatis, of those people of his nation, they were very, very short in comparison to the life of, we know, for example, Nuh alayhi salam. فَلَبِثَ فِي قَوْمِهِ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَمْسِينَ عَامًا Allah Ta'ala says he remained with his people 950 years. So if, imagine if Nuh alayhi salam, this is the Qur'an, if Nuh alayhi salam remained with his people, da'wah, for 950 years, how long did he live? And obviously if he lived that long, he was sent to a people who lived that long. So there was, there was a time of ancient peoples and ancient civilizations. And these people, they lived really, really long. And they were very, very large in stature as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this in the Qur'an. So, فَكَأَنَّهُ تَقَاصَرَ أَعْمَارُ أُمَّتِهِ أَلَّا يَبْلُغُ مِنَ الْعَمَلِ الَّذِي بَلَغَ غَيْرُهُمْ مِنْ طُولِ الْعُمْرِ فِي طُولِ الْعُمْرِ So he said, the Prophet ﷺ, he felt that his ummah on the Day of Judgment are not going to be able to compete in good deeds like the other ummah, like the other nations. People will have opportunity. I mean, just if you live a thousand years, I mean, you, how much more are you going to pray? How much more you're going to do good deeds? How much more charity you're going to give? How much more dua you're going to make? How much more dhikr you're going to make? How much more charity you're going to give? How much more you know, righteousness are you going to do? Obviously. So the Prophet ﷺ was concerned about his ummah, that it should not be that my ummah falls short on the day of judgment. فَأَعْطَاهُ اللَّهُ لَيْلَةَ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرًا مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a gift to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him one night that is equal to a thousand months. One night that is equal to what? Eighty some years. What is it? Eighty-three years and? Some months, right? Four months? Eighty-three years and some months. This is, the, this is that. So basically, and, and very simple. What, what can be done on these Mubarak nights? Right? What is, what is the, how can a person attain Laylatul Qadr? Brothers and sisters, I tell you one thing. The one who performs Salatul Isha in the masjid with jama'ah, and you perform salatul taraweeh, 20 rakats, you've already gotten the great virtue of Laylatul Qadr. A lot of times people, people come and ask me, what can I do on this night? And, you know, reciting of Quran, and making of dhikr, and reading a thousand rakats, and reading a thousand dhikrs, and so on and so forth. Brothers and sisters, don't consider insignificant the sunnah of the Prophet. The salatul taraweeh that every single one of us do, we pray it, and then we go straight home and go to sleep. Wallahi, you've gotten something great on that night. Don't consider that night insignificant. 20 rakats, if that night happens to be Laylatul Qadr, and you receive the blessing of Laylatul Qadr, you've received 83 years of, subhanAllah, 
that 20 rakats of salat in your account if Allah accepts it. The thing that the Prophet Ali so, so this was a gift of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah Azza wa Jal gave this gift to uh, the Prophet and his ummah. So let us on these Mubarak nights at least do one thing. Read some salawat upon the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Read some Quran and convey its blessings upon Sayyidina Muhammad through whose blessing we have received these. Where does Laylatul Qadr come from? It came from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where did we get this Quran? It came from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where did we get Ramadan? It came from Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where did we get the fasting? Or the Quran? Or Iman? Or Islam? Never forget where we got these blessings from. Send abundant salutations upon Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on this night. Because it is through his barakah, through his virtue, through his gham, through his concern for his ummah, that Allah ta'ala gave, gave him this gift. وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى O Muhammad Wasallam, your Lord will bestow upon you and you will be pleased. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, what the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam would do, because of this, i'tikaf has been ordained. And i'tikaf, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do from the day that he came to Medina Munawwara. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, every single year, dedicated ten last ten nights of the i'tikaf, last ten nights of Ramadan to i'tikaf. And what is the reality of i'tikaf? As is mentioned here, subhanAllah, by uh, Shaykh uh, Ibn Rajab Hanbali, what a beautiful thing. He says, قَتْلُ الْعَلَائِقِ عَنِ الْخَلَائِقِ لِلْإِتِّصَالِ بِخِدْمَةِ الْخَالِقِ قَتْلُ الْعَلَائِقِ عَنِ الْخَلَائِقِ لِلْإِتِّصَالِ بِخِدْمَةِ الْخَالِقِ To cut off all relations with the creation, to connect with the creator of all creation. You disconnect yourself from all of creation to connect with the Creator. SubhanAllah, this was the objective. And the Prophet ﷺ would do this in particular to seek the blessing of Laylatul Qadr. The whole purpose of i'tikaf, that the last 10 nights the Prophet ﷺ would stay in the masjid. And not only that, SubhanAllah, now we have brothers that do i'tikaf. This is not, <laughs> the whole purpose of i'tikaf is seclusion. Not socialization. You go, it's like a social club. People are like, you know, like late night discussions. We have on Friday night. It's like late night discussions. People are just like, you know, as if it's their own bedroom. They're hanging out, you know, coffee, tea, gup shop, you know, all these various different types of things. That the whole objective was seclusion. The Prophet ﷺ did this. And remember, what the Prophet ﷺ used to do in his i'tikaf, in the masjid he had a tent. In the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ had a little tent, a Turkish round tent, and he would sit inside of that tent in the masjid. The Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it wasn't like a so socialization. The Prophet ﷺ wouldn't give long, long lectures. What he would do is he would sit in seclusion for what? So that every second and every minute of his time would be written as ibadah. The sunnah is the most beautiful way to maximize the reward of Laylatul Qadr. Imagine, what would you think would be the greatest way to worship on Laylatul Qadr? Reading Quran, making zikr, making dua, praying nafil, what do you think would be the best thing? None of those can equal sitting in the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ has sanctioned and made sunnah, such an act of worship that the whole time that you're in there, for every second that you're sitting inside the house of Allah, it is written that you're in worship. When you're sitting, right now you're sitting in the house of Allah Ta'ala, the angels are saying, Allahumma ghfir lahu, Allahumma rahamhu, Allahumma salli alayh. Oh Allah, forgive him. Oh Allah, have mercy upon him. Oh Allah, send your salutations upon him. Every second that you're sitting in the masjid, the meter is on. You know, in the olden days, they had the taxi in, in Pakistan and other places, they still have the, the meter. You sit in the car and they turn on the meter and it goes... They turn on the meter, and you know the the, the you know the bicep, you know the bicep is like yeah, go ahead, Bajan, go go and do whatever you want to do. The meter is on. They leave the meter on, and as the meter is on, then the you know the the money is racking up, right? The fee, right? The rate is racking up. Similarly, when you enter the masjid, as long as you are in Allah's house, you are doing nothing. You're just right now, and even nobody is in ibadat. Right now, nobody is in, in, in reading Qur'an. You're not in standing in tarawih. You're not in prayer. You're not in dhikr. You're not in dua. But you're just sitting here. The angels are making three duas for you. Allahumma ghfir lahu. Oh Allah, forgive him. Allahumma rahamhu. Oh Allah, have mercy on him. Allahumma salli alayhi. Oh Allah, send your salutations upon him. Imagine. What ibadah could be greater than just sitting 
and continuously accruing rewards. The masjid is the greenhouse of the soul. Do you guys know what is a greenhouse? You know the gar- the, those, those places where they keep the plants tomatoes and vegetables and plants and fruits it's a really hot house and they put it's like a you know they grow plants in there it's a greenhouse and when you put it in there the humidity of that room and the environment and the wetness and the moisture causes the fruits to become ripe you guys know what is a greenhouse right it's a house and it absorbs the sunlight and it becomes you know it's it's a it's a conducive for plants to grow the masjid is the greenhouse of the ruh. When you enter into this place, the nuraniyat and the company of the angels and the effulgence and the nur and the light and the blessings and, the, and, 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 and the, the mercy of Allah that is descending causes the ruh to become ripe. It causes the ruh to become mature. It causes the ruh to come to life and grow. This is the greenhouse of the soul. So what you're doing in the etikaf you're entering and every minute and second of it is an act of worship. Subhanallah. How can you outdo the sunnah? You can't get that reward any, in anything else. Because look, when you read Quran, you finish reading Quran, you're done. You're not in worship no more. If I'm making zikr, I make zikr and then I'm not, I'm not in worship anymore. Right? If I'm praying salat, as soon as I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum, I'm not in worship anymore. But when you're sitting in the masjid, every minute and second and, and, and hour that you're sitting there, even if you're sleeping, it is written as ibadat. Even sleeping, you're in worship. So the Prophet ﷺ did this in the last 10 nights, so that even if you're sleeping, you will get the entire night of worship. Even if you're doing nothing, you're just sitting there. You're getting the entire night of worship. For this reason, for the attainment of Laylatul Qadr, so that he can maximize the blessings of Laylatul Qadr, the Prophet ﷺ sat in Atikaf. And he did not miss this until the last year that he left from this world. We understand the importance now of Atikaf. Another thing, brothers and sisters, we need to disconnect sometimes. That's why it breaks my heart when I see people come for Atikaf and it's a socialization program. It's socializing. It's discussions. It's like, you know, jumping jacks and God knows what other types of things. Just disconnect. Disconnect when you are in this 10 nights. I remember there was an etikaf. The guy brought his whole mattress from the house. I said, you should have brought the, you know, the whole, like, you know, the, 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 the headboard and everything, you know? The whole king size, and then, you know, he had a, you know, his whole uh, iPad and, uh, you know, the screen and everything, and he's sitting like this, you know, and clicking the, why, why? I mean, the whole purpose is to disconnect. That's the objective, to disconnect. And what are you doing when you're here? You're, you, you know, it, it, and this is even worse, you're in the masjid, and you're disconnected from Allah. This is the dangerous thing, that a person is in the masjid, and he's disconnected from Allah. It's better for you to be at home, <laughs> disconnected from everything, than to be in the masjid, disconnected from Allah. If you're going to come to the masjid, the whole objective is that you cut out all of those things that you have at home. That's the purpose of being in the masjid. You're cutting out those things that are at home, to avoid those things that are at home. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ did it. We all need that disconnect. Brothers, there has been studies that have been done that a lot of the stress that people have is because of what? It's because the constant year of like, you know, being involved in all these various different types of things. Sometimes we need, just need to be by ourselves. Sometimes we just need to focus, to re- reset button, to press that button, reset. Who am I? What's my objective? Why am I here in this world? What am I doing? What have I achieved? What, where am I going? What have I done so far? And gives you that time to sit alone and ponder. And that is why some, some places you want to even go for etikaf. There was a brother who specifically told me, Sheikh, I really wanted to come for etikaf this year to this masjid, but there's so much talking and uh, socializing, I'd rather just stay home. My home is better and I get more seclusion when I'm at home in the darkness of my own room and my own house than I do at the masjid. This is a very sad situation that somebody should say, I'm not going to come to the masjid for etikaf because there's too much socialization. I can't concentrate. Let me tell you this much also. When you're in etikaf and even you're reading Quran loudly, 
that's disturbing somebody else, then don't do it. And don't become like so, you tell some certain people, they become like so offended, as if, Who's your grandfather's house? Even at your grandfather's house, when your grandpa gets mad, you calm yourself down. But at the house of Allah, nobody has a right to say anything to nobody. This should not, we should not hijack Allah's house. We should be very, very careful that this is something that's not owned by me or by some other sheikh or Imam Saab or Qadi Saab or Hafiz Saab. This is something for everybody. If one person gets taklif, let me tell you this very important thing, and this is for the Mu'atakifin and those who are Ghair Mu'atakifin. If one person is getting taklif from my worship, that worship is considered not accepted. If one person is getting taklif and bothered by my reading loudly, by my praying loudly, by my whatever actions, then consider your worship and your etikaf not, not even worthwhile. Because you have to deal with now other human beings as well. Adabi mu'asharat. I mean, imagine who, who would imagine? I, I mean, if the Prophet would go inside of his tent, I would say, Ya Rasulullah, show yourself to me. I just want to look at you. This is the greatest ibadat. But the Prophet would not even allow himself to be seen. He would not be wanted, wanting to be seen. He would seclude himself in the masjid. And what are we doing? If you imagine that, how much guarding himself from others he would do. And he was the Prophet of Allah that don't you think that for him to be open, for everyone to see is the greatest ibadat for the eyes of the Sahaba? If I was the Sahaba, I wouldn't do no worship. I would just sit there and stare at the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Stare at him. This is the greatest ibadat and worship. That much he wouldn't give. Now imagine what the objective is. The objective is not socialization. It's seclusion. Qat'ul alaiq. This is the definition of Ibn Rajab. Qat'ul alaiq. Cutting off all ties. Anil khalaiq. From all of creation. Lil ittisali bi khidmatil khaliq so that we can connect with the khidmat of the khaliq, the worship of our creator. May Allah give us that. May Allah make us understand the true reality of this Mubarak night. Try to attain this, these blessed nights, even in the odd nights. Some of the ulama are even of the opinion that it could be on, on, on the even nights. It's a minority opinion. But some of the scholars said that they have the opinion that it could be on the 24th night. So let's not be saying, okay, we, we only do the odd nights and neglect the even nights. Every single one of the blessed last 10 nights and days are blessed. May Allah give us tawfiq to do as much worship as we can on these nights. And what the Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Ya Rasulullah, if I know that it is Laylatul Qadr, or it could be Laylatul Qadr that night, what dua should I read? So the Prophet said, read this dua. Allahumma innaka afuun. تُحِبُّ الْعَفْوَ فَعْفُ anni. Oh Allah, verily you are the most pardoning and you love to pardon, so pardon me, Ya Allah. In other words, even though my worship is not worthy of your majesty, just forgive me. Because if I get forgiveness on that night, this is the greatest blessing. Many of our sisters ask, what about the sisters who don't do i'tikaf in the masjid? I'tikaf, according to the Hanafi madhab, that much I know, is not sunnah for the sisters in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith of Bukhari, it comes that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made a tikaf, and some of the ladies, they also brought their tents inside of the masjid, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what is this like? What, what, are you, what are you people doing? You know, they, you know, they brought their tents, and it started becoming like, you know, crowded in the masjid, said, no, this is, don't do this. So some say, the, our fuqaha, our scholars take the opinion that he was saying that this is the, this, the undesirability of sisters to do a tikaf in the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, right? And others say, no, it was because they were competing with one another. Whatever the case may be, the ulama mentioned that if a female, if a woman who has responsibilities, mashallah, she has a child, she has responsibilities in the home, if she were to designate a place in her home, and that area she designates that this is my mu'takaf, this is my place of atikaf, and she does her Qur'an and recites, and then whenever she has a need, she goes out maybe for the cooking or for anything she needs, for the needs of the family or the needs of the children, she goes out, but then she comes back to her place of itikaf, inshallah she will get the same reward of what the people are getting in the masjid, and that is what our scholars have mentioned. May Allah give us tawfiq to implement what has been said. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, 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 alhamd